So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming on the eve before spring break. So I admire your tenacity here. And uh, welcome to the 11th, I think it's the 11th of our John E. Sawyer seminar um, for the Mellon Foundation. And it's with, uh, my name is Ruth O'Brien, and I'm in political science. And uh, it's with great pleasure today, I'm going to skip all the normal thank yous and introductions, since you've heard them so many times. And it's with great pleasure that we have today before us Ira Katz Nelson. And uh, he's the author of seven books. It, well, first of all, I, I should let you know that he's been a great inspiration to me, always a terrific mentor, and, um, and just an, an, an inspiration intellectually, because not only does, does he do American politics, but he also does political theory, and he's got such a wide range of um, topics. So let me give you a few of those topics. He's the author of seven single-authored books, and going in reverse order, we have When Affirmative Action Was White, An Untold History, of Racial Inequality in the 20th Century, Black Men, White Cities, Race, Politics, and Migration in the United States, City Trenches, Urban Politics, and Patterns of the Class in the United States, Schooling for All Class, Race and the Decline of Democrat and, and the Democratic Ideal, Marxism in the City, Liberalism, Crooked Circle, Letters to Adam Michnik, and Desolation and Enlightenment, Political Knowledge After Total War and Totalitarianism and the Holocaust. This is just a single author books. He has another seven co-edited and edited books, including some classics like Working for Class Formation, 19th Century Patterns in Western Europe and North America, Paths of Emancipation, Jews, States, and Citizenship, Shaped by War and Trade, International Influence on American Political Development, Political Science, the State of the Discipline, Preferences and Situations, Points of Intersection between Historical and Rational Choice Institutionalism, Religion and Democracy in the United States, Religion and Political Imagination. And he's just become the president of the Social Science Research Council. And before that, in 2005, 2006, he was the president of the American Political Science Association, which was not his first presidency, because he was also the president of Social Science History Association. He's been the chair of the Russell Sage Foundation Board of Trustees, in addition to himself being awarded Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as his many other awards. Today, though, he's going to talk, he was just uh, about his his new book, Fear Itself, The New Deal, and the Origins of Our Time, Liberal Beginnings, Making a Republic for the Moderns. Thank you, Ira, for coming. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, what, it, um, what it taught me is that uh, uh, some decades have passed in my life and I've uh, reached a certain maturity. Um, in any event, it's a, it, it's a treat to be here. I'm, I am going to talk about this book, Fear Itself, um, in three ways, um, but in, in, in a way that doesn't simply separate them out, but tries to join them together. Part of this, my conversation, or my remarks, will be um, historiographical. Uh, there are many, many books on, and articles on the New Deal. Why write a book subtitled The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time? Um, second, I want to make some empirical remarks about what it is um, uh, this book, I believe, um, I won't say has discovered, but it has, um, has focused on um, factually, as it were. Um, and then third and last, and perhaps most important in a group of this character, is um, to talk analytically um, about some of the key themes, um, uh, some philosophical, uh, that underpin um, the book Fear itself. Let me begin with um, a colleague who worked in this building, um, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., certainly a leading figure in the Graduate Center and arguably um, the single most important historian of the American New Deal. Um, shortly before his death in February 2007, Professor Schlesinger wrote the following, Conceptions of the past are far from stable. They are perennially revised by the urgencies of the present when new urgencies arise in our own times and lives the historian's spotlight shifts, probing now into the shadows, throwing into sharp relief things that were always there but that earlier historians had excised from collective memory. New voices ring out of the historical darkness and demand attention. I read that text 
just as I was uh, beginning to write this book in a serious way. And I'd already been um, attending to a series of voices that surprised me. Let me just quote three or four of them. And these are from notes written um, 2007. Um, and I, uh, my, I almost didn't get out of primary school because of the quality of my handwriting. <laughs> so I, I hope I can still read them properly. Um, 1939. Walter Lippmann, America's leading journalist. Three times in these 20 years, the American people have had great hope, and three times they have been greatly disappointed. Um, now, what were these three times for Lippmann? They were the disappointment uh, after the First World War, uh, a disappointment that the expectation that the full globe would uh, embrace democracy um, had not happened. Indeed, the period of the interwar years was a period of the collapse of democracies, most dramatically uh, Weimar, but hardly exclusively Weimar. More than 20 constitutional democracies in Europe, uh, Asia, and Latin America toppled uh, between the two <coughs> world wars. The second great disappointment was the promise of material prosperity that represented by the great boom of the 19. 20s, and of course that didn't last with the great collapse of capitalism in 1929. But the third source of disappointment Lippmann reported on as a mass phenomenon was the American New Deal. Um, now that shocked me when I read that text um, because uh, think of our own understanding and certainly Arthur Schlesinger's understanding um, at the end of his three, third volume of the trilogy, The Age of Roosevelt, um, Schlesinger said the age of Roosevelt began with fear, and um, Roosevelt conquered fear. Um, by 1936, hope had been restored to the American people. Um, and here's Lippmann three years later, designating the New Deal as one of the three great disappointments. Um, or, uh, second, listen to Senator James Eastland of Mississippi. Um, and now this is on the floor of the U.S. Senate, January 31st, 1944, um, in the midst of a debate about how soldiers might get to vote. Um, there were 11, 12 million Americans under arms in uh, 1944. The election, um, as it turned out, was held after D-Day, so there are huge armies, American armies, um, uh, on the ground in France, um, heading toward Germany. Um, and of course, there are sailors all over the Pacific. Um, how should they vote? Well, no one said they shouldn't vote. But they obviously couldn't just get absentee ballots in the normal way. The Roosevelt administration proposed that every soldier in the field be given uh, a ballot and could write in Roosevelt or Dewey, who was the Republican candidate for president, to send it back. But that bill proposed to Congress didn't pass. The one that passed was written by James Eastland of Mississippi and uh, John Rankin, also of Mississippi. Um, and this in the debate uh, was what um, Eastland said to justify his bill, which I'll come back to, but which made it very difficult for many to vote. These boys are fighting to maintain the rights of the states. But these boys are fighting to maintain white supremacy. That's a precise quote on the floor of the U.S. Senate. And um, it wasn't, as it were, the, a crank statement. This is the, the statement by the person whose bill passed and became the, the Soldier Voting Act of 1944. Or um, listen, let's see, two, two more quick ones. I have a longer list, but let's not take too much time. Uh, E.B. White, the great writer. Simply, um, this is a letter to the New York Herald Tribune, in which I put right at the front, uh, as a frontispiece uh, quote, uh, uh, um, he wrote to the Herald Tribune in November 1947, I live in an age of fear. Um, I live in an age of fear, not 1933, but 1947, after the recovery of capitalism, after the victory in the second World War. And finally, Dwight Eisenhower, his inaugural 1953, January 53. Science seems ready to confer on, I have my hand writing, um, on us as its final gift the power to erase human life from this planet.
another source or statement of fear. And it was these various voices, diverse voices, um, calling out that um, had the effect of changing the focus of what I had intended to write. What I originally had intended to write was a book that contrasted the Reagan Revolution and the Roosevelt Re Revolution in terms of a moment of major ideological inflection in American, as moments of major ideological inflection in American political development. One, the birth of modern liberalism, and the other, a, a moment truly of the birth of, of the learning philosophy of modern American conservatism. That is a book still worth writing, but it's not the book I wrote. Uh, the book I wrote is a book about fear and democracy, and it was generated by hearing voices across a 20-year period, um, beginning with the inauguration of Franklin Roosevelt in uh, March, on March 4th, um, uh, 1933, and ending with the inauguration of Dwight Eisenhower in uh, January 1953. And I, uh, in hearing those voices, I decided to write about the 1930s and 1940s to better understand the relationship of democracy and fear. And our time, our moment, has produced anxieties, perhaps not of the same magnitude, but I believe um, we're being tested um, under conditions of economic volatility, um, for global uh, zealotry, military insecurity. Um, we're being tested in similar ways. So by exploring how the New Deal dealt with such challenges, fear itself probes not just the achievements, but the cost of doing what was necessary to preserve liberal democracy and protect its values. Now, what I want to say a bit about is how I went about doing this uh, task and what I found, and then stand back and ask some analytical questions. Um, well, the book um, investigates fear and democracy by offering four shifts in perspective, four shifts in vantage. The first I've already implicitly, or more than implicitly mentioned, um, the book extends um, the period of the New Deal um, beyond what ordinarily is called the New Deal, that is through the Truman administration. Um, and I did that for three reasons, the first being pretty straightforward, the other two perhaps less so. The straightforward reason is Harry Truman was Franklin Roosevelt's last vice president um, and was uh, clearly part of uh, the age of Roosevelt. Um, uh, he was only president of the United States because Roosevelt died in April 1945 um, and of course then got reelected. but um, originally he was simply there as Roosevelt's vice president. Um, there was a 20-year period of Democratic Party rule, um, Roosevelt and Truman, uninterrupted Democratic presidential rule, and 18 of those 20 years um, were marked by the existence of Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate. Only the Congress elected in 1946, the 80th Congress, uh, had Republican majorities. Um, so we're talking about an, quite an uncommon period in American history in which uh, control of the presidency and the Congress is in the hands of a single political party. And these were not trivial moments in the making of uh, modern uh, America. Now, the second reason to extend the period um, has to do with fear. Um, uh, this, um, these 20 years were a, um, uh, a moment of a layering of sources of fear. Let me now jump ahead to an analytical statement, something I was planning to say for later, but let me do it now, um, about fear. Fear is not, um, fear is generated by circumstances rather different than those of ordinary risk. Um, here I'm relying on a distinction made in the 1920s by the University of Chicago economist uh, Frank Knight. Um, who uh, distinguished in a book of the early 1920s between fear and risk. Um, life's full of risks. We marry. 50% um, uh, of marriages end badly. Um, 
we buy a home. We uh, we take a chance about it going up in value. For example, we used to think all homes go up in value, but they don't. Um, but when we take chances like that, marrying, buying a home, um, we um, we believe, with good reason, that we can assess probabilities, that the parameters within which um, we make choices um, are knowable, um, and therefore the probabilities of outcome are also knowable when we make decisions. But there are circumstances that seem or are so unique um, that it becomes impossible to assess probabilities, and such circumstances generate fear. Um, Think about the 1930s and 1940s. The utter collapse of market capitalism uh, globally, but the United States actually, uh, the United States and Germany were the two places where that collapse was most felt. Um, we hit 25% unemployment um, in the United States, but in an era where very few women were in the wage labor force, that meant that something approximating 50% of American families um, had to survive without uh, a wage earner with a job. Um, this was utterly unprecedented. Uh, even nothing, we've had collapses before. There were the Great Depressions in the 1890s, the 1870s, and the 1840s. But the scale of and the duration of the collapse of capitalism after 1929 was unprecedented. And no one, I repeat, no one, um, had a, 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 a grasp of what policy options um, might be available to effectively solve uh, the problem. Um, uh, so that's one fear generating, uh, and we all, that's what, when Franklin Roosevelt uh, told us that we had nothing to fear but fear itself, he was speaking primarily to, to that source of fear, but not exclusively, um, because that very moment of his inauguration was in a moment, a moment marked by the manifest uh, competition um, for liberal democracies, for representative democracies, by new kinds of mass dictatorships. Um, uh, Hitler, of course, was um, became chancellor of Germany just five weeks before the inauguration of Franklin Roosevelt on January 31st, um, 1933. But the regime of Mussolini in Italy from 1922, um, and the Bolshevik regime, especially the former under Stalin, um, uh, stood as uh, counterexamples um, uh, and as challengers to the capacities of liberal democracies. Um, and they generated fear. They, of course, very different uh, at one level. I, you know, there are great debates about the word totalitarianism. I think it's both right and wrong. They are regimes which share things in common. Mussolini proudly announced, uh, we are totalitarians. Um, the, the phrase was initially, the term was initially created by anti-fascist journalists um, in the early 20s. And Mussolini's rejoinder was to say, thank you very much. We are totalitarian because there's unimpeded connection between a total state and the people. Um, we are a better democracy than the liberal democracies because we represent the whole of the Italian nation. We're not polarized like the parliamentary democracies. Um, we have a strong sense of public interest, unlike the parliamentary democracies. Money doesn't buy ideology as it does in the parliamentary democracies. Um, and we have a single party that represents the people. Well, the same line of argument, albeit with different content, was stated by uh, the Bolshevik party and by uh, the Nazi party, who represented their versions of the people directly uh, in an unmediated way, uh, the working class, the race in Germany, the nation in, um, in Italy. Well, these mass democracies, they were mass, quote, democracies, not liberal, illiberal democracies, um, were themselves sources of fear. Um, because they posed the kind of challenge that the liberal democracies were not sure they could rejoin. There was an utter lack of confidence, uh, utter may be too strong, but a, a great lack of confidence, a high degree of the absence of confidence um, in the early 1930s about the capacity of 
with parliamentary democracies, including American democracy, to effectively govern and respond to the challenges of those, quote, democratic dictatorships. And, and on it went, the violence of the Second World War, um, which was um, far more profound and deep than even the violence of the killing fields of the First War. Civilians, for example, in Europe were far more at risk in the Second War um, than, than the First. And, and of course, the Second World War culminated with the use of atomic weapons, a form of, um, of violence not known, um, not even imagined, uh, just a few years uh, earlier, something not imagined but, but by any but some physicists a few years um, earlier. And that, the war ends with the discovery of the genocide of the Holocaust, followed by the Cold War, and then with the second partner of the Cold War itself developing atomic uh, weapons after 1949. As a primary school child during the Korean War, I had to do duck and cover exercises under my desk as an eight or nine year old, and I wore a dog tag to school. Um, should there be an attack on the United States by the Soviet Union, um, my body could be found. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be if it was a nuclear attack. <laughs> um, now, th these are layerings of sources of fear. Um, and uh, the, that is, every single one of these circumstances had unprecedented qualities. Uh, and fear-generating qualities. There was no set of status quo policies to which you could just turn to deal with any of these um, uh, forms of challenge or emergency. And the other feature, another feature of, that comes with extending time uh, through the Truman administration is that it allows us to see an object, an important object of analysis, the one that I think justifies my somewhat grand subtitle, The Origins of Our Time, um, uh, we could see an object of analysis that we wouldn't have otherwise discerned. Um, namely, the development of a new American state um, whose two faces, and I, like the Roman god Janus, um, that um, had not existed, neither of which had existed um, when Franklin Roosevelt took his oath of office. On the domestic side, of course, across that 20-year period, we developed a national state um, that was um, much larger, uh, had new programs, Social Security, uh, uh, had chartered trade unions in the Wagner Act, uh, had created minimum wage and maximum hours, had created systems of public relief, had created aid to dependent children, uh, families, ultimately AFDC, welfare, um, had created um, uh, a very long list of agencies that dealt with securities regulation, agriculture, and the like. This was a radically new state, um, uh, so much so that um, um, Ackerman has called it a constitutional revolution. We can argue about that. Um, but. This new state on the domestic side, uh, by the end of the 1940s into the 1950s, had um, a <coughs> peculiar and interesting combination of um, being a, a national state that was, uh, as David Truman wrote in 1951 in his book on the governmental process, was essentially an interest group state. Uh, you didn't have to buy everything said about pluralism and um, the way uh, the analysis of 1950s political science um, described the state, but I think Truman had it right. That is, he described a, a, a national state that was not like a European corporatist state that had labor and business and, and government bargaining. Um, it was not a planning state. It was an interest group state, uh, a state in which literally hundreds, uh, by some counts thousands, of um, organized groups competed for the largesse of the national government in Washington. And as E.E. E. Schatzschneider famously put it, um, that chorus sung with an upper class accent. It was a bias and a tilt which had to do with money, in which business power was greater than labor power, uh, etc. But that state, that interest group state, was very thick with procedures. It's hard to pass a law, for example, in Congress, but was very thin on any a priori sense of public interest. Um, the public interest, and, and again back to David Truman and 
those of you who are political scientists will know this, this book on the governmental process, argue there's no such thing as the public interest in American life. The public interest is what the process, what the rules played out under the rules of the game, produces. So in today's world, if um, the Affordable Care Act passes, that's the public interest. And if a Republican Congress and a president were to repeal the Obamacare, that would be the public interest. There's no a priori interest, say, in a certain kind of health care system under the assumptions of that kind of interest group state. That's one side. The other side of the state, created by the end of the Truman years, was completely the inverse. It was a state incredibly strong on public interest, the national security part of the state. The national security state is a state that fights for democracy, against dictatorship, against fascism, against Nazism, against Stalinism, um, but has almost no, or had and still has, almost no procedural constraints. Um, should a president of the United States uh, get a memo from the Department of Justice that says it's okay to go after an American citizen who, who's uh, suspected of terrorism, who happens to be uh, many thousands of miles away, it is possible to kill him um, without trial. Um, now that, I'm not now arguing the, the, the rights or wrongs, so though I have my views, the, um, uh, uh, but that kind of, that part of the national state is a state with very few uh, constraints on, especially on executive action. And it was born, all the institutions of that state were born in the Truman years. Uh, after the Second World War. Um, Joint Chiefs of Staff, National Security Council, uh, the permanent Pentagon, uh, which became, under its new name, Department of Defense, not Department of War, um, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, uh, atomic energy governance institutions, uh, and the like. And it is uh, largely a uh, side of the state that social scientists, political scientists, don't study very much. Actually, they leave it to the international relations scholars. Those of us who, who teach American politics tend only to tilt towards the domestic side of the, of the state. But anyway, we got both outcomes. And I wanted this book to try, in part, to explain how we got that two-sided uh, double uh, national state. That's the object of analysis. So if the subject is fear of democracy, um, the empirical object is um, how we got this two-sided two national, new national state, neither side of which existed when Franklin Roosevelt took the oath of office. And that's, the, that's the, the move of extending in time. Well, the second move I've already commented on, so I can be much briefer. It was the attempt to situate the New Deal in a global context the context especially of the competition of the new dictatorships and parliamentary democracies, a competition of democracies certainly in um, the spring of, or the late winter of 1933 seemed to be losing. Um, and the, there was an analysis that was articulated not just by Mussolini and Hitler and Stalin, though they all articulated it, um, uh, interesting footnote on Mussolini on the eve of Roosevelt's inauguration gave a speech in which he said the gods of liberalism are dying. All experiments of our age are anti-liberal. Um, and that critique was echoed by friends of democracy um, uh, throughout the West. Uh, Walter Lippmann, whom I mentioned before, um, wrote a series of columns on the eve of um, Roosevelt's inauguration in which uh, he argued, and I'm not going to quote very briefly, uh, how the situation requires strong medicine. And he advocated a grant of what he called extraordinary powers to the incoming president, insisting the danger we have to fear is not that Congress will give Franklin Roosevelt too much power, but that it will deny him the power he needs. This is the month before Roosevelt took office. The danger is not that we shall lose our liberties, but that we shall not be able to act with the necessary <laughs> speed and comprehensiveness. Accordingly, he proposed, that extraordinary authority should give the president, and I quote, for a period, say, of a year, 
the widest and fullest powers under the most liberal interpretation of the Constitution. And he proposed that Congress should, and I quote, suspend temporarily the rule of both houses to limit drastically the right of amendment and debate and to put the majority in both houses under the decisions of a caucus, that is the party caucus. So the party should rule, not Congress. The Democrat Party should rule. And this supersession of normal politics, Lipman concluded, is, quote, the necessary thing to do if the American nation desires action and results, this is the way to get them. Now, um, this was not just an abstraction um, or, a, or a proposal from nowhere. In 1922, the first act of Mussolini was to ask the parliament in, um, uh, in Rome to pass an enabling act. And an enabling act meant a transfer of power from the legislature to the executive. And 19 days after um, Roosevelt was inaugurated, the German Reichstag voted to yield all legislative power in the, in the emergency to the cabinet of Adolf Hitler. So this was not, enabling acts were not an unknown um, uh, or strange idea. They were in the air. And in effect, Lippmann proposed an American enabling act, albeit a a temporary one, uh, perhaps something like the model of Roman dictatorship. Um, so the, the politics, including the politics of fear at the moment of the Roosevelt um, inauguration, the first inauguration, certainly, was a moment in which fear was clearly generated by this competition with the dictatorships and a sense that some of the instruments used by the dictatorships would have to be used in the United States in order to govern effectively and meet the emergency. The third shift the book makes is away from primary attention from the riveting figures of Franklin Roosevelt and, for that matter, Harry Truman, um, and away from a focus uh, on the executive branch, which is what most New Deal histories do. They focus on, on Roosevelt and the, and the New Deal administration toward Congress. Why? Because Congress was thought to be the central problem. Um, uh, that's why Lippmann wanted it suspended. Um, it was said that liberal democracies could not govern because they had thick procedures of legislative of lawmaking. Um, and what I decided to do is to focus on Congress um, in, in a critical way because Congress itself was the instrument that the New Deal used um, across the 20 years to meet the various emergencies of the collapse of capitalism, the Second World War, um, the Cold War. But it should not be forgotten um, that in his inaugural address, Franklin Roosevelt actually flirted with Lippmann's extra constitutional proposals. We all remember, nothing to fear but fear itself, that's the beginning of the address. If you watch a film of that speech, um, you will note that uh, that's not a big applause line. Um, the crowd does not get up as one. They did get up and cheer wildly when he said the following. Um, it may be, um, well, he, it's when the president voiced misgivings about the ability of Congress to cope. And he cautioned, I would think, uh, I would, might say cautioned ominously, how, quote, it might be that an unprecedented demand and need for undelayed action may call for a temporary departure from the normal balance of public procedure. Should Congress not act promptly and decisively, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I, will ask, I shall ask Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were, in fact, invaded by a foreign foe. Yay, that's a year, right? Um, and the New York Times, if you read for weeks afterwards, talked about the atmosphere of dictatorship, um, or potential dictatorship in Washington. And, not, and I'm not now talking about the very common charge that the right made against Roosevelt throughout the whole period, dictator, dictator. Um, but just in the immediate aftermath of the inaugural, the friends of Roosevelt, as well as the enemies of Roosevelt, um, used such language. Now, to me, the most profound feature of the American New Deal 
is that the, that step was never taken. There was no American enabling act. The gods of liberalism did not die. The dictatorship's vortex of violence and brutality was not only met by Trump, but trumped by a model of constitutionalism and law. Um, all of the New Deal is a history of lawmaking, um, not the history of the suspension of lawmaking. Um, we can argue about the character of the lawmaking, but not about the fact itself. Even during the Hundred Days, the legislature dealt with the economic emergency through ordinary legislation, uh, however novel and far-reaching, rather than by yielding lawmaking to the executive or declaring a state of exception. And after the Hundred Days, congressional forms of dispute, debate, and decision survived and thrived. So Congress was not a casualty of the country's crises, but an instrument that sought to overcome them. And I think that's uh, remarkably important. Um, now, the fourth and last shift, um, arguably the main shift in the, in, 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 in the book, is the shift within Congress to the American South. Um, the Democratic Party of the 19... Um, of the 1930s and 1940s was an extraordinary uh, hybrid, uh, uh, a marriage of strange bedfellows. Um, uh, the northern wing of the party, the social democratic, quasi-social democratic in character, labor-oriented, immigrant, uh, Catholic, Jewish, um, uh, urban, uh, overwhelmingly, um, uh, and whose politics often took a machine form, um, uh, Chicago, New York, elsewhere, um, uh, ethnic uh, political machines. Um, that's the North, the South, rural, not urban, Protestant, not Catholic or Jewish, um, not immigrant as opposed to immigrant, um, etc. They could not have been more different. Um, and they were, at the time of the American New Deal, not 11 states, that's the number that seceded the Civil War, uh, but 17 states in the Union that mandated racial segregation. And by mandating racial segregation, I mean that if a given township said black and white children can go to school together, in those 17 states that was not possible. Um, there was no freedom locally to have black people and white people together in schools, mostly in public accommodations, on uh, buses, uh, etc. Et, 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 et Those 17 states elected 34 United States senators. In 1940, to pick one year, they were all Democrats. Um, uh, 34 United States senators. Um, in the House of Representatives had a huge uh, Southern tilt. Why? Because Southerners, like the rest of the country, got representation on the basis of their population not on the basis of the voters. They had a very low franchise, one party, largely one party system in the American South, um, but they got representatives as if they had a fully inclusive franchise system. I'll give you an extreme example. It is an extreme example, but I think it's telling. 1938, the state of Mississippi elected seven members of the House. Um, there were 2.3 million people who lived in Mississippi. Um, the aggregate number of votes cast the f across the seven races in Mississippi for Congress in 1938 was 43,000. Um, only one of those candidates got more than 10,000 votes. Most got 3,000, 4,000 votes. And none ran with an opponent. Um, it was a pure, one-party, low-franchise system. Yet, Mississippi got seven representatives. If only they didn't get representation based on an electorate of 43,000, but on based on 2.3 million. And because the Southerners, um, this is familiar to all of us, really, but it's worth saying, I think, because it was a one-party, low-franchise system, you got immense seniority. And because you got a man's seniority, who were the leaders of uh, the committees? Who were the leaders of um, uh, of the House and the Senate, including such great people as ultimately as Lyndon Johnson or Sam Rayburn? Um, but it was quote no accident 
given the advantages of the South had, that Congress was critically a Southern institution, and especially a Southern democratic institution in the period of the New Deal. Well, that produced a question for me. What role, what distinctive preferences did Southerners have in lawmaking that shaped the making of the modern American state? This state that was strong on procedures and weak on public interest on one side, and strong on public interest and weak on procedures on the other. And uh, I don't want to take a lot more time, but the shorthand version of the story is in the 1930s, at least until 1938, when the Southerners were still a minority of the majority party, not much of a minority, about 45% of uh, Democrats after the Roosevelt landslides were from the South, nothing could pass into law that they, of which they did not approve. That is, they had a veto in Congress. And in the 1940s, everything that passed into law mapped exactly onto Southern preferences, because by now, they were a majority of the Democratic Party. Once the, um, once the Republicans had made a comeback after 1938, 40, 42, 44, um, the majority of Democrats in Congress were from the Jim Crow South. So in that sense, they made the New Deal. And the question is, so what? What difference did that make? Well, I think it made a lot of difference. And um, here are just a, a very quick capsule, and I'll end with some examples. Um, in 19, um, in the mid-1930s, there's a first period, really up until 1938, where neither politi major political party um, showed any um, concern for matters of race and segregation. As the Republicans as well as the Democrats basically agreed that Southerners could keep their autonomy in issues of race. The Republicans, traditionally a civil rights party, um, learned in 1928 when Al Smith was the candidate of the Democrats, they could actually win states in the South. Um, they could mobilize white Southerners to vote Republican, in that case because of anti-Catholicism. Um, so they didn't want to mess with race relations as Roosevelt was becoming president. And Roosevelt certainly didn't want to because he wanted Southern support. So this is something I wrote about in a previous book and when affirmative action was white, all the legislation passed during the New Deal, uh, the, the classic New Deal years up until 1938, um, uh, exempted uh, farm workers and maids. Uh, that is to say, Social Security. You didn't get Social Security if you were a farm worker or a maid. You didn't get protection of the Wagner Act. You didn't get a minimum wage or a 40-hour work week. None of the legislation, because the Southerners wouldn't have it. Um, why? Obviously, uh, black people worked the land and served as maids. The women were, worked as domestics, and the men were 90 80% of, uh, of the black labor force in the South was agrarian. Um, after 1938, Race did enter the agenda in a more serious way, and especially during the Second World War, and especially with the growth of the CIO. And at that point, on the domestic side, you begin to see the Southerners, who were not conservatives. They were largely on the left. They were progressives. Um, they loved federal spending and big, big they were dirt poor. A, a third of uh, Southern households, only a third of Southern households, had running water and electricity simultaneously in the, according to the 1930 census. So they liked the federal government to spend money. But, um, but they became increasingly fearful. And when you began to see the change was on labor law. Um, and by 1947, it was only because the Southerners voted unanimously to override President uh, Truman's veto of Taft-Hartley that the labor movement suffered an immense defeat. After Taft-Hartley, it became impossible for the American labor movement to be a truly national force. And as a result of that, the modern interest group state was born, not a quasi-corporatist state, but a, a, an inter the interest group state described by David Truman. So the, the strong on procedures, weak on public interest state was largely the product of decisions taken by Southern Democrats about labor as well as other matters. The national security state was also built by Southerners, and sometimes, retrospectively, was a good thing. Um, in 1941, President Roosevelt proposed extending the peacetime draft. 
Um, uh, this is five months before Pearl Harbor. Um, there had been a peacetime draft for the first time in 1940. It required um, uh, soldiers to serve for only one year, and they could not leave the Western Hemisphere. That was the isolationists insisted on that. Um, looking around, and after the invasion of the Soviet Union by, uh, by the Nazi state, um, uh, Roosevelt said, we really need an army. Um, who knows what will happen next? And called for um, the extension of the peacetime draft and removing the constraints on where they could serve and how long. And the vote in the House was 203 to 202. Um, passed by one vote. Five months before Pearl Harbor, had it not passed, the United States would have had an armed force smaller than Belgium's um, uh, uh, when the Second World War uh, would have begun. Uh, for the, would have begun for the United States. Um, who voted for it? The Republicans did not. They argued a peacetime draft is a threat to liberty. Uh, and they were in the whole isolationists. Um, Northern Democrats were split in half. Those who had Irish constituents, German and Italian constituents voted no. Um, people with Irish constituencies didn't want to help the British very much. Um, and German and Italian constituencies didn't want their kids going to fight their cousins. Um, it was only because a nearly unanimous Southern Bloc voted yes that we have any army at all or navy uh, on the eve of the war. But it was also the Southern Bloc after the war that provided the key votes for the national security state. Um, and the, so there's a shorthand version um, which of, of my story, which is that we have to make the Southern contribution constitutive of um, of, of the history of the New Deal and the making of modern um, America. Do I have five more minutes? Or am I sure, just um, uh, let me just reflect slightly more abstractly on a series of questions and then conclude. Um, consider just briefly the following um, small number of, of issues. I've already talked a little bit, not really deeply, but analytically about fear as opposed to risk. But think of um, three other kinds of questions which have um, concern uh, people as uh, in various disciplines, whether they're philosophers or political scientists or historians or sociologists. Um, questions that have to do with um, moral ambiguity and problems of dirty hands, um, doing bad in order to do good. Um, uh, uh, questions that concern um, uh, what it means to talk about a modern state and even such dichotomies as weak versus strong state. Think of the bringing the state back in volume of uh, Evans and Rushmeyer and Scotchpole and, and, and others. Um, and then third, think about um, the puzzles, certainly that scholars of American political development, think of the work of Roger Smith, for example, have been deeply concerned about, about the imbrication or connection or lack of connection um, between uh, the, the liberal tradition in America and the history of racism. Um, and in some ways, the, the book I've written, although it's written as a trade book and it's not written, um, uh, it's written for audiences, I hope that it'll be somewhat um, broader than um, uh, very focused uh, uh, university audiences. But underneath this book lie these questions about, about fear, about moral ambiguity, about state, and about race and liberalism. Um, and the, um, the dirty hands question is, is pretty powerful throughout this period. Um, um, it's not just the, the, the alliance of northern Democrats with southern uh, racists. Um, it's, uh, there are complicated relations throughout this period of, um, and of compromises made, some of them the kind Abishai Margalit would call rotten compromises. Um, first with Mussolini's fascism, um, which uh, was seen by many in America as the good authoritarianism as opposed to Nazi or Stalinist authoritarianism. Roosevelt himself <coughs> sent a study group to Rome in 1935 to figure out how a good executive branch should be organized. <laughs> Um, the, um, uh, there was the, um, and when I write about this, Talo Balbo, the Minister of Aviation, 
uh, in the Mussolini government, who was famous. Um, he was one of the four leaders of the March on Rome. He was famous for inventing new forms of, of torture in the 1920s. Uh, he flew to America in an armada of 24 seaplanes, landed in Chicago, ticker tape of 1 million, New York, ticker tape 2 million. Um, he visited Franklin and Eleanor at the White House in the summer of 1933. Um, and today in Chicago, you still can walk on Balbo Street, which is the corner of Michigan, where the Hilton Hotel is in Michigan and Balbo. And there's a statue up that commemorates his, his arrival. Uh, there was a kind of invocation, of, um, or at least a dealing with um, fascism um, and American uh, uh, democracy that's complicated. Um, in, or take one other example, um, uh, the Soviet Union, of course, which was our, without the alliance with the Soviet Union, the Second World War would have been lost. Um, but at Nuremberg, um, the chief judge um, uh, on the opening day was uh, Iola Nikitschenko. Um, and the New York Times said when he died, he was a man who had considerable judicial experience. He, he provide, presided over the Kamenev Zenobia Perth trial. That was his experience before Nuremberg. Um, the, uh, there are lots of stories throughout this period of discomforting alliances, uh, um, which um, are justifiable in the sense of um, doing bad to do good. Um, and it raises questions for us, which I don't have any neat answers to, about how the criteria of assessment of, uh, in such circumstances, but the deepest of such dirty hands, uh, as it were, um, uh, stories of this period, is the persisting alliance of northern and southern Democrats to make a new deal, a fair deal. And then very briefly to conclude, um, it seems to me if there's a, there are at least two lessons about um, thinking about weak and strong states in this uh, book. Um, uh, one, that certainly in the American um, setting, it's impossible to assess such matters uh, absent the legislature and Congress, but it's almost always, state strength is almost exclusively measured in terms of how many bureaucrats you have, how many agencies you have, how strong the executive is. Um, uh, I think the whole idea of weak and strong is far too simple, and there are diff very different qualitative ways in terms of policy and institutions by which a state can be strong. Certainly the American state was very strong and became much stronger in the 1930s and 1940s, but not in a way that the traditional literature on state strength recognizes as strong. And finally, on the issues of liberalism and racism, um, Maybe we can talk about this in discussion, but uh, certainly the kind of Roger Smith story, I adore Roger Smith and his work, but the kind of story in which he says there's a liberal tradition and then there's separately a, a racial or racist tradition uh, and a scriptive tradition in American life seems to me to be absolutely the wrong way to go about thinking about this. Instead, we should think about how some of the central institutions of the liberal tradition, a tradition based on consent, rule of law, uh, individual rights, um, uh, and the like, how, how key features of that institution, um, A, have nothing a priori to say about membership, uh, who gets to have those rights, um, and second, some of the key practices and institutions central to the liberal tradition open up the possibility of hospitality to the kind of strange bedfellows arrangements that constituted the American polity in the 19th 30s and 1940s, the very rules of political representation port to the center of the state the preferences of members of civil society. If those preferences are racist, they get ported. Um, and moreover, in the American Congress, and I will stop here, um, the, um, once any member of the southern wing of the polity crossed the threshold of Congress, that person became a liberal representative like any other. Um, that is, with exactly the same rights and responsibilities. Um, and there was amnesia about uh, how they got there. So the political system um, worked by a set of rules that uh, reproduced a system of rule of law, a system of government by consent, a system of political representation, a system of rights with um, uh, racism. Um, made constitutive of it.
and I will truly end by just reading the last two paragraphs. Some of you have seen, but I'll, 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 I like them of the, uh, <laughs> the introduction. If history plays tricks, Southern congressional power in the last era of Jim Crow was a big one. The ability of the New Deal to confront the era's most heinous dictatorships by reshaping liberal democracy required accommodating the most violent and illiberal part of the political system, keeping the South inside the game of democracy. But while it would be folly to argue that members of the Southern wing of the Democratic Party alone determined the choices the New Deal made, their relative cohesion and their assessment of policy choices through the filter of an anxious protection of white supremacy often proved decisive. The triumph, in short, cannot be severed from the sorrow. Liberal democracy prospered as a result of an accommodation with racial humiliation and a system of lawful exclusion and principled terror. Each constituted the other like the united double nature of both soul and body in Goethe's Faust. This combination confers a larger message, a lesson that concerns the persistence of emergency, the inescapability of moral ambiguity, perhaps the inevitability of a politics of discomforting allies. It also reminds us that not just whether, but how we find our way truly matters. Thank you. Um, I'm also I'm pleased today to have Carol Nakanoff. She's going to be the discussant, um, and she's going to discuss uh, our work as well as add a few comments of her own. Uh, for those of you that don't know Carol, Carol is the Richter Professor of Political Science at Swarthmore. Um, she herself is the author of The Fictional Republic, Horatio Alger Jr. and The American Political Discourse. She's written some pivotal articles, um, some of which many of you out there have read, as well as Ira's work. Um, including the APD, um, one of my favorites is Groundhog Day again, is, is, is the liberal tradition, a useful construction for studying law, the courts, and APD. She's edited several books, including Jane Addams and the Practice of the American Discourse, and soon, and you'll soon see State Building from the Outside In, Agency and Institutional Foundations Between Reconstruction and the New Deal, which is coming out with Penn in this new um, series in APD. Carol, thank you for coming. been saving my voice all day. <laughs> I do the best I can. Um, I'm glad there's a microphone. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is a great book, and so that's one wonderful reason uh, that I'm pleased to do this. Also, Ira was second reader on my dissertation committee at the University of Chicago many years ago. Um, I believe that I represented some of the early um, research for this book um, at Swarthmore as part of a year-long series uh, that Rick Valerie and I put together. Um, uh, and it prompted an altercation between two of my colleagues, one of whom uh, had a visceral distaste for the War of Northern Aggression. So, uh, <laughs> um, I also, uh, I also am a citizen of the segregated South. Uh, I grew up, I started life and school in a state that did not have, that had mandated uh, state segregation. I also am thrilled to do this because it occasioned a little family togetherness. Uh, my husband, Jim Greer, uh, had Ira as the chair of his dissertation committee. And uh, it's rare that he and I can sit down and read a book together at the same time and discuss. I bought him the Kindle edition. I bought the book. And, um, and we've had a chance to talk a little bit. Um, and Jim has some questions for, for you too, but I'm going to do them right now. Jim always has questions. <laughs> as to you. Um, um, when I started my career doing, while well, I started my career doing quantitative um, political science survey research work, uh, to try to get at some questions linked to American political culture and beliefs about success. I've moved into historical research and also to the court. Um, Ira has picked up, and uh, who's had a 
career-long interest in race, has <coughs> picked up and run with a fancy database of congressional roll call voting from the first Congress forward, the uh, um, uh, Poole and uh, Rosenthal uh, uh, nominate, um, which uses a vote scaling procedure and uh, allows him to produce these great figures that you'll find, um, for example, in the Jim Crow Congress chapter. Um, and uh, these scatter plots of roll call votes um, are quite dramatic in making the case about the shift of Southern votes from the early part of the New Deal toward the latter part of the New Deal, toward uh, moving from partisan and cross-partisan toward incorporating increasingly sectional and disloyal patterns as the South felt threatened on Jim Crow. Um, um, I was asked to do several things today, not a comment, of course, on the book, talk about myself a little bit, but also to tie this project into the themes of the um, Sawyer Seminar, if I, if I can do so, and I think, I, I, mean, I, I think it certainly does fit in. Um, so one of the things I was interested in is bringing Congress back in to the study of American political development. Now, since AP, he explained just quite eloquently that Congress was considered to be the biggest problem in solving the crisis of liberalism, and, um, and yet it became a means of solving that problem. So that's a very good reason to bring Congress back in. But since APD, um, at least as a project that Stephen Skoranek had a big hand in shaping, focuses on the rise of the administrative state, uh, especially during the Progressive Era, many scholars following Skoranek have focused their work on the presidency and on the bureaucracy. Um, the creation of the New Deal state Looked at is looked at in, in terms of the bureaucratic and executive politics at its center, as Ira has pointed out. There has been some recent criticism of the assumption that state building is driven by bureaucratic elites um, and the allies that they turn to to expand their warrant to govern. Um, um, and Ira wants to restore sectional and party struggles in Congress um, to a central role in explaining the rise of a unique set of policies that could have come about no other way. Um, also, for Ira, the New Deal is in a class of its own. Um, he is not of the school that I tend to work in. Um, I work on the Progressive Era, um, where we tend to see the Progressive Era as preparing the way for the New Deal, and in many ways prefiguring many New Deal programs so that for many scholars of the Progressive Era, the New Deal is a difference of degree rather than a difference in kind. However, for Ira, that's quite not, that's very much not the way to look at it. Um, um, in terms of this criticism of the uh, focus on bureaucratic uh, and, and presidential origins of the administrative state, I've been involved in a couple of projects uh, trying to alter the Skoranek narrative as well. Um, in a study of the juvenile court movement that began just around the turn of the last century, my colleague Kathleen Sullivan and I um, have been uh, arguing that courts and uh, court innovation was much more important to APD than many scholars think. Um, and that uh, the, the demise of the, the Skoranek idea of the demise of the state of courts and parties um, downplays the role of the court. Um, the first mother's pensions were administered by juvenile courts. So um, uh, they were often uh, experimenting with new social programs. Um, the Ch Children's Bureau um, emerges from the juvenile court. Movement. And then the second point, um, uh, a book Julie Novkoff and I have just finished for a, a pen, State Building from the Outside In, is looking at the role of non-state actors um, so there are other ways of, of thinking about how to critique the Skoranek um, overemphasis on um, uh, state building as a administrative, uh, uh, executive branch uh, action. Ira's book is also, apart from just focusing on Congress, is importantly uh, bringing foreign policy and international relations 
back into the study of American domestic politics. And this is a very important contribution to thinking about the New Deal. Um, to, to reiterate, um, there's the fear for liberalism, fear for democracy. Could democracy reform and deal with challenges? Um, fascism, Nazism, genocide, tyranny, depression, and later the Cold War. Um, this was not, Iris says, a normal politics of risk. Um, uh, so there was a need for a more, what I call a more muscular liberalism to deal with recurring, escalating insecurity um, and uncertainty. For Ira, um, there is a sense of rupture from the past represented here by the New Deal, or as Bruce Ackerman might say, a constitutional moment um, without a roadmap. Um, a sense that previous solutions were not going to provide the answer. So building a stronger American liberal state is the backdrop, uh, is the problem against which FDR and his friends and allies were able to get through Congress a, I suppose I could, uh, I would almost say wildly audacious for the United States. Um, program that included federal regulation of the private economy, the corporate features planning, extensive infrastructural spending, banking security and exchange reform, social insurance, and pretty high tax rates that were also progressive. Um, open the world to commerce, eventually you know, buttress by low tariffs. And um, for IRA, one of the reasons um, um, it's important to note that I think a prevailing view of the South in this period of Southern Democrats is that they are reluctantly brought along. But for IRA, these are not reluctant dance partners. Um, they were seriously into the anti-Wall Street um, you know, economic reform agenda, uh, bringing economic growth and development to the South, supportive of the foreign policy agenda, of mobilizing against foreign threats, rejection of isolation, um, despite his, Hitler's fascination with the American Southern racial order. Um, so we have uh, Southern Democrats in a one-party South facing few electoral constraints um, who are very enthusiastic about these important elements. In fact, not only could Roosevelt have not have done it without them, they are really cheerleaders for some of these policies. Um, so the Southern Democrats, the most backward part of the country in many ways, the most underdeveloped part of the country in many ways, was supportive of the most radical part of the New Deal economic and social agenda so long as it didn't implicate race. And in the process, Ira says, that but the legislative agenda didn't just leave Jim Crow alone, it fortified the system. For example, leaving the wage hierarchy in place um, through um, decentralization of administration of some, but by the way, not all, uh, federal programs. One of my husband's questions was, did the Southerners just not care about the ones that didn't have decentralized administration? Um, <coughs> Um, the exclusion of domestic workers, the exclusion of farm workers from an awful lot of these protections, the ability of the Southerners could, to, discern, to determine uh, who had, had access to federal government benefits was, was key to their participation in it. The Sawyer Seminar is focused on how democratic societies can be inclusive of a wide range of cultural practices and forms of expression while maintaining a commitment to respecting a secular public sphere, universal human rights, and women's equality. On this score, the book Fear itself is not going to tell a terribly optimistic story. Um, many of the advances of the New Deal um, to build a stronger state with a social democratic agenda did so with the collaboration of Southern Democrats who wanted to grow the South and integrate into the national industrial economy. But the Roosevelt administration had to make a bargain with the devil 
uh, the Southern Democrats in Congress were determined to hold on to the Southern way of life, and they held the cards, though they were a minority in Congress, for a, a variety of reasons they held the cards. Um, they were able to define the outer limits of what was politically and prog programmatically possible in the U.S. during one of these key moments of nation building. Um, um, as long as I've known Ira, I've, I've associated him with studying the pattern of American politics and historical perspective. That is key in defining moments. Back then we didn't use the term path dependence, but there is a sense of path dependence to, to this story. Um, that once certain kinds of policies are put in place, uh, it has set the tone for the modern era. Um, so in this key moment, the racially repressive South could kill anti-lynching bills and resist any serious attention to its peculiar institution. Um, now, maybe the, the question is, what kinds of political societies, I'm, I'm, I'm not leaving the book, this is just sort of a thought exercise a second. What kinds of political societies can be inclusive, tolerant, committed to rights? If they do reasonably well at some moments, do they do better for some groups than for others? And is there any reason to believe that they will do better across the board or over time? Um, this seems in the United States to be a good time for gay marriage. If I were betting, my guess is that DOMA will suffer a, some kind of a defeat in the Supreme Court. I don't think the California case will. But um, uh, it's a good time for, don't, for, for gays and gay marriage, but a bad time for affirmative action, a bad time for the Voting Rights Act. Um, does the national security state, the national surveillance state, as some of my friends call it, um, and the more or less permanent mobilization of fear in the war on terror bode ill for attention to inequality and rights. Um, uh, in, a, in addition, uh, other kind of things that things are not simply linear. Philadelphia, in, in the paper yesterday, was reported as having the highest percentage of its residents in deep poverty, uh, which is defined as less than half, having much, uh, income less than half of the poverty level, uh, among the top 10 cities in the United States. Uh, Detroit tops the list of any cities with near 20%. Uh, the Paul Ryan budget would cut SNAP food assistance program by tens of billions of dollars, according to this story. Um, and at least 9% of people on SNAP have no other source of, of income at all. Um, so we certainly are not living in a world uh, uh, that is uh, clearly tending toward um, uh, more inclusion uh, on, on a variety of fronts. Irish democratic state is one committed to process, not norms. That outcomes are contingent. There are unholy bargains. But this is all, but we don't live Iris world, and, and we don't live in a world of what Ken Kirsch has called the Whiggish narrative of gradual progress toward greater rights over time, toward greater enlightenment. Um, it's also not Louis Hartz's world of a value consensus, to be sure. Uh, it's more Dahl's world we live in. Democracy is process. Now, um, I, I was struck to think about Mark Graber's Dred Scott and the Problem of Constitutional Evil mm -hmm. in connection with this book. William Lloyd Garrison, of course, called the Constitution a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. Um, but Graeber, who's written a, a fascinating book about uh, Dred Scott, claims that constitutions are deliberate compromises made, made among people who have very different moral goods and evils. And we call good different things. If people sharing civic space cannot engage in constitutional compromises, they're hardly likely to exist as a people. Compromises lay down some rules that allow us to agree to disagree. And he would illustrate with slavery, and he'd illustrate with abortion. Now, while Robert Weeby once argued that America consisted of segmented societies in part because of the availability of land 
allowed communities to move away from each other rather than figure out how to solve their different disagreements. Graeber thinks that constitutions can erect certain kinds of barriers between those who cannot agree. Um, when compromises work, each side agrees not to, tr uh, to try not to compel the other to change. That keeps, it, it keeps issues off the table. The continued existence of that constitutional regime depended on the continued satisfaction of each side with the constitutional bargain graver rights. So you have changing times, changing circumstances, demographic shifts that alter the sectional balance of power in the legislature, in the antebellum America, changing the political, changing political problems that may implicate the bargain, bargain, and it may get disrupted. This is what Graeber says happened during the late antebellum <coughs> era. Um, so if the uh, uh, constitutional bargain is threatened, um, then what? Um, that, that destabilizes the, the deal. Hart says, Hart says nothing to tell us. Uh, uh, here, the, Hart says the Constitution did not fare very well in the only time any such fundamental value struggles did appear in the United States, the time of the slavery controversy in the middle of the 19th century. Indeed, Congress and President Buchanan urged the court to participate in political conflict by pressing that institution to attempt resolution of a contentious issue. Keith Whittington and Graeber talk about the propensity of elected branches to relocate decision making on certain issues to the judi judiciary and say that that is nothing new in American history. Um, another slight aside, of course that account that I'm just spinning presumes that the parties understood and agreed to a particular bargain and thought that they had constitutionally arranged the limits and boundary conditions, or at least that they could foresee the risks, to use Iris' term. They could foresee what kind of changes might happen and that they thought the bargain would not be disrupted. This account presumes we agree on the meaning of words, and David Greenstone, in his uh, classic work on liberal bipolarity points out there are different ways to understand the relationship between liberty and union, the way to understand different constitutional values, and that those differences in understanding can produce some things like a civil war, even though David wants to call them inside the liberal tradition. So how constitutional understandings change and the relationship between constitutional politics and ordinary legislative partisan politics is an important question, I think. Southerners who fought desegregation surely believed a constitutional bargain had been broken, that the Constitution had been violated. And while Ira does um, talk about this, um, when the a federal government eventually does um, put its thumb down on the scale on, and, and on behalf of civil rights. It doesn't do so for some of the reasons that people think. It does so because of foreign policy reasons. Um, Mary <coughs> Dudziak has a nice book called Cold War Civil Rights. The U.S. Justice Department brief in Brown, which was filed during the Truman administration, focused on the mileage the Soviets were getting in the Cold War among the black and brown people of the world, pointing out the gap between U.S.'s rhetoric and practice. It went on to talk about the embarrassment caused to diplomats in Washington, D.C. when um, diplomats were refused service or accommodation upon the assumption that they were black. So where am I going with this point? Iris focused on Congress as the locus of <coughs> carrying out FDR's policy agenda, the essential role of Congress and lawmaking in the New Deal. But in the New Deal court, from the second Roosevelt term forward, started playing a role <coughs> that reflects on the grand and dirty bargain as well. A complaint about modern courts, not just the US courts, um, but uh, it's certainly a complaint here. <coughs> 
is that they displace conflicts from the political arena and constitutionalize them. Ron Herschel, in his book, Juristocracy, argues that where judicial empowerment through constitutionalization occurs, it generally re results from a strategic tripartite pact between hegemonic yet increasingly threatened political elites seeking to insulate their policy preferences from the vicissitudes of democratic politics, economic elites who share a commitment to free markets and a concomitant antipathy to government, and a Supreme Court seeking to enhance their symbolic power and institutional positions. Now, he's writing especially about the juris uh, judicialization of political conflict after World War II. But Roger Smith, not in Civic Ideals, but in a more recent piece that he's done, adds that if elites have seen the rise of judicial power as a way to complete the construction of modern constitutional democracies, they have done so in part because they feel their core interests are likely to be better protected in, democrat in democratized regimes through the strengthening of these relatively insulated political institutions. So elites may be able to preserve and promote the acquisition of wealth. Um, it may be that judicialization of conflict and, uh, is a strategic attempt to delimit and contain political debate within relatively safe channels for elites as democratization expands. Um, uh, Carl Clare, who's a, a, a lefty um, legal scholar, um, talks about how the court de-radicalized the Wagner Act, how the White Wagner Act had lots more dramatic potential than it ultimately came to have through its sort of curbed reading, increasingly curbed reading, um, which helped give us the Taft-Hartley Act uh, later. So what if, what if we look at this effort to save democracy in the face of struggles to expand democracy and think about what role the court might have played in the, in the New Deal strategy. Um, so once the court became the emphasis for, for, for progressive reform on race because it was not likely to happen in Congress for the very reasons Ira says so well. Uh, Kevin McMahon, in a book called Recons Reconsidering Roosevelt on Race, uh, published in 2004 by University of Chicago, finds an affinity between the legal, legal realist movement and FDR's views and his desire to challenge orthodoxy. Um, he says Roosevelt attempted to reshape the court as a liberal institution and as an agent of the modern presidency, uh, a court that was more deferential to executive authority. Um, uh, is it possible, plausible that there's another kind of Janus face here, that the, that the New Dealers are in fact pursuing a two-front strategy uh, in dealing with their Southern problem and the race issue? Um, so the civil liberties <coughs> turn of the court after Roosevelt starts getting some of his appointees in um, leads to the famous footnote for Caroline Products in 1938, where Marlon Fisk Stone um, uh, says, uh, um, I'm just trying to think about, see, uh, when we talk about the, the probable need to scrutinize more closely um, uh, statutes directed at particular religions or national or racial minorities, whether prejudice against discrete and insular minorities may be a special condition which tends seriously to curtail the operation of those political processes ordinarily to be relied upon to protect minorities and which may call for a more correspondingly more searching judicial inquiry. Now, I would come back at me and say, well, but Jimmy Byrne, Burns was put on the court and Jimmy Burns had never been a friend to a racially liberal order. But Frank Murphy, who headed up the Justice Department, was, and some of Frank, they were, many of these were legal realists who nonetheless saw law as an instrument of, of power. Um, so I'm just curious, because it seems to me that there's another piece of that story uh, that, that may go along with what you're doing. Um, I remember long ago, uh, Ted Lowy, uh, Ted Lowy's review of uh, the Bauer Pool and Dexter book, American Business Public Policy, 
in which powerful indexers say, well, business really wasn't that influential because they were afraid of throwing their weight around in Congress. Turns out that all the uh, activity on GATT was going on in the executive branch. I'm simply saying there's something else I would like to look at here to, to see if there's a, a, a different kind of story. Um, there's a parallel to Graeber's antebellum, but Graeber believes that part of the reason the grand bargain broke down was because of population shifts. And that while the South believed that they would maintain um, a good representation in Congress, population shifted north and west, upset the bargain, and people started meddling with it. Well, here, there's a, a similar kind of phenomenon, I think, where you pointed out that white Southern Democrats are overrepresented because their representation is based on population. But if they don't allow blacks to vote, you're just overrepresenting uh, uh, whites. Um, plus the seniority system and plus all that stuff. But there, we, we are already witnessing the first big migration of African Americans to the North. Uh, Northern Democrats are starting to pay attention. They're beginning cultivating black votes. Ira points out how dramatic was the shift in black voting allegiances between 1932 and 1936. Um, they were attracted to New Deal economic programs and to Eleanor Roosevelt's outspokenness and so on. So there was new pressure in Congress to do something um, for these new um, constituencies. It upsets the constitutional bargain. Um, I'm going to skip over some stuff and, and try to tie this up. So American politics for Ira is a politics of moral ambiguity, complicity, a question of who gets thrown under the bus. This is always hard for my undergraduates, um, mm -hmm. who um, famously said once that the Democrats should not have compromised um, to get the uh, Civil Rights uh, I'm sorry, the um, Civil Rights Act with people who put gender in the bill in an attempt to kill it, um, that they wouldn't make such bargains. And I said, well, then don't get into politics. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a question of with whom do you make alliances, not do you make them. And American policy making, Ira says, is confined within a southern cage during the early and mid New Deal. Um, and illiberal political orders, the US South, and illiberal orders abroad influence the New Deal legacy. So he says this impacts our own time. More illiberal portions of the South had the greatest impact on the New Deal were veto players. And to save liberal democracy, the Roosevelt, uh, uh, the, the Democrats, had to fail to pursue racial democracy. Well, we are to post-racial democracy today. Um, Michael Tesler and David Sears have a neat book that I've taught called Obama's Race that measures racial racial resentment using attitude scales and finds that it doesn't just that racial resentment, which is still alive and well, doesn't just predict attitudes for welfare and affirmative action, but virtually any policy proposal Obama makes on bailout, on health care, or anything. Whereas before Obama's election, these particular kinds of policies didn't track racial resentment at all. Um, even the dog Bo, if you show people a picture of Bo and say that it's Ted Kennedy's dog, or you tell the other half of the sample that it's Obama's dog, people who are racially resentful you know, hate the Obama dog. Um, so there are all sorts of subtle ways in which um, racism is alive and well. Um, Many people voted for Hillary in the primary, who nonetheless had very traditional attitudes about women working outside the home, or would they, you know, could a woman be a good politician? They still voted for her, turns out, because it was the racial resentment. Um, we're now witnessing fights between people who do not want America to change and those who are less fearful. Uh, we have uh, uh, Putnam and Campbell point out to us that we are polarized by religion, that Republicans are the re religious party, the people who go to church, and the Democrats increasingly are the party of people who don't. Um, we have, in America, very different narratives of, about fairness. We have very different narratives about what government policies actually are, what they do, 
Um, we have very different narratives about whether elections are fair. We're witnessing a new wave of ballot access restriction. We are witnessing, I would say, an assault on many women's issues. Uh, we got to talk about real rape, um, an assault on abortion, assault on access to birth control, um, and an ass assault on birth control as a First Amendment freedom of religion or religious conscious issue. Um, uh, we are witnessing some attempt to dismantle the, the welfare state, the devolution of some of the power that the Roosevelt administration um, helped bring us. Um, so what are we going to face in the future? Future, um, It's very unclear. Um, Iris is the New Deal, borrowing from Lowy, ushered in a second republic in the United States. Though the Constitution wasn't formally amended, it has governed the United States ever since. But is it being dismantled? Now, he would, Ira would say that the, um, uh, we're living with many of the legacies of the New Deal uh, in terms of the, the fear and the mobilization and the uh, surveillance. And um, uh, he says, uh, and the interest group politics. Um, so uh, these are things that are legacies. The policies themselves may be vulnerable. And it's not clear what the status of this constitutional moment is. Thank you. Thank you.